the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship here at St. Thomas's Church. I am keenly aware at this time, as we have been for weeks, that many of you are suffering under the influence of COVID-19. This morning, I hear that this also includes the brothers at the Society of St. John the Evangelist in Boston, and they have had to close the monastery to public worship and to public participation in everything. So our thoughts and prayers this morning go out to those of you wherever you are, but most especially to the members of this parish and to the members of the Society of St. John the Evangelist in Boston as we all try and get through this most recent affectation of COVID. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. This we ask through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Listen now, for God speaks to us in the words of Holy Scripture. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand 
that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding feast at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. He said to them, no, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tested the water that had come from the wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the servant called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. The Gospel of Christ. Two weeks ago, we celebrated that event that we call the Epiphany, capital T, capital E, a proper name for the time when the Magi came to visit the Christ child. And in that, we see a couple of things happening. One is that the Gentile world, the entire non-Jewish world, recognized who this was and came to visit. Now, entire, I mean the scholars of that world, came to visit. And the second was that they brought him three presents. We don't know how many wise men there were, but they brought three presents, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And those are directly related to the kind of prophecies that we see in Isaiah and elsewhere just before Christmas. 
I like to call them the Messiah prophecies because they're the same words that are echoed in Handel's Messiah. King of kings, Lord of lords, his kingdom will go on forever and ever. Alleluia. But there are epiphanies that are not the epiphany. So I was thinking it would be interesting to look at the other epiphanies that happen at this time of year. And there are three that generally happen right at this time of year. The second one is, of course, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan, where right after the baptism, we hear about the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. So in spite of what you might see in art, particularly classical art, it wasn't necessarily a bird, it was something that came fluttering down on him. If you've ever watched doves landing, they don't come in for a smooth landing like a jumbo jet, they sort of flap around to stop themselves. And a voice came from heaven and said, you are my son. So in that moment, we have an epiphany. But what exactly is an epiphany? Because obviously that's not the three kings. So I looked it up in the dictionary because I was having trouble describing it myself, although I knew what it was. And the dictionary's version of this is a sudden intuitive perception or insight into the reality or essential meaning of something, usually initiated by some simple, homely or commonplace occurrence or experience, which is probably why they discover, or why John, sorry, why Luke describes it like a dove descending upon him. That is something that, that people could understand. But in that moment and the moment of the voice, those who understand the story realize who this is. So now we have two epiphanies. One to some wise scholars from the East who came to visit the Christ child, probably when he was about two years old. And I realize that makes all of our crush scenes inaccurate, but that's okay because they came. And the second one in this moment uh, in the River Jordan. And I said last week that there were several water experiences through which Israel went and the people who went through that experience became a new people, not because they passed through the Jordan, but because they had been through the experience beforehand and passing through the Red Sea or the Jordan River marked a change and a new direction in the community, particularly entering the promised land. Now we have another epiphany. Jesus goes to a wedding. Now, there's more going on here than meets the eye. And the first clue for me is one that I think many of you can relate to. The bride never gets mentioned. Have you ever been to a wedding when the entire crowd outside and everybody else didn't want to see the bride? We all turn around to watch as the bride comes in here and walks down the aisle with her dad or her husband-to-be. We want to see what the bride looks like. Now, I grew up, or our children are both girls, so maybe I'm a little slanted on this, but whenever we drove by a wedding when the kids were young, everybody wanted to stop and see the bride. It's what we do. I have never met a young woman who is about to be married who isn't the most stunningly beautiful person I have ever seen in that moment. They're radiant, they're lovely. The bride doesn't get a mention. Now you could write this off and say, well, it was a patriarchal society, she didn't matter, it was the husband and the wine that everyone was interested in, and that's still true. If you go to a wedding these days, people are interested in getting to the bar. They don't want the church service to be an hour and a half long, when does the bar open? It's true, isn't it? But the first clue for this in a Christian community is that the bride doesn't get mentioned. That means it's not really the wedding that's going on here. The picture that we used at the beginning of our service this morning, and I'll, I'll put it on the screen again now, is by a Danish artist, and his name and information is on the screen for you. Look at the size of the water jars. Quite often we have these 
wine jugs in pictures, or some of the famous Italian artists had they're fairly big ewers, but not the size of these things. These things are huge, as you can see, and I think that captures what's really going on here. Throughout Jewish literature, prophetic literature, the relationship between God and Israel, and therefore each one of us, is depicted as a wedding feast. We have been invited to the feast so often we don't want to go. So often we don't want to be there. And in this case, the metaphorical wedding feast, and I am not saying this wedding feast did not take place. I'm saying there's a second layer here. This feast had run out of wine. Now, when a wedding feast runs out of wine, a little bit of the joie de vivre goes with it. I know there are lots of wedding feasts where Uncle Sam or, or you know, Aunt Joe has a few too many. That's not what I'm talking about here. God bless them both. I'm talking about the fact that a couple of glasses of wine at a meal can just loosen things up and help us all have a good time. So this wedding feast, this metaphor for God's relationship with all of us, had gone dry, they'd run out of wine. And the Son of God brings more wine, and not just more, <clears throat> he brings approximately the equivalent of six bathtubs worth of wine. It's hard to fathom a stone jar. Think of your bathtub. Did you know the average bathtub in North America holds about 40 gallons of wine. Sorry, water. <laughs> I'm assuming you don't bathe in wine. With you in it and me not looking, it's about 30 gallons of wine because you have displaced some of the water. Think of six bathtubs full of water. That's how much wine. That's a lot of wine. It's an abundance that is almost unimaginable. Now, I have been to parties where they have an old bathtub full of beer and ice in the summertime. I've seen that. I've always thought it was a little on the gauche side, but okay. But that's mostly full of ice. The only reason the beer bottles are there are to get cold. So think of just the liquid volume and you've got the idea here. There is an abundance when Jesus Christ is present at this wedding feast that simply isn't there at other times. When Israel, one more point, when Israel was in the wilderness, they crossed the Red Sea, they went to Mount Sinai and they gathered there. And God spoke to Moses and said, go down and tell Israel that I am getting ready to come down on the third day. I will come down and speak to them and give them my law. That turned out to be the Ten Commandments. And Israel, in response to that, at least the leaders of Israel, said, thank you, Moses. Tell God we'll do whatever God wants. You can read that for yourself in Genesis 19. Not quite the words I used. When the wine runs out at the wedding feast, we first hear that it was the third day in echo of what happened at Sinai. A new covenant is being formed here. On Sinai, God said, on the third day, I'll come down and give you this new covenant, the Ten Commandments and other things. At the wedding feast, it was the third day. And Mary comes along she has this discussion with Jesus, and Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? But after that, Mary turns to the servants and says, do whatever he asks for you. Do whatever he wants you to do in echo of what happened at Sinai. So John, the gospel writer, is saying, listen, I'm not leaving out the bride to twig you to something's wrong with my humanity by not noticing how beautiful a bride is. 
I want you to get that there is a much bigger story going on here. On the third day, God acted. Jesus came, God came to this wedding. The servants did exactly what they were told and the wine was restored. An epiphany. Suddenly, you realize, oh my gosh, this isn't just about a wedding. It's not just about a party. It's not just about the people. No wonder we didn't talk about the bride and the groom very much. It's about Jesus. It's about God. And what can happen when we invite God in the form of Jesus Christ into the wedding that we have all been invited to? So, we learned during this Epiphany Tide season that Jesus is the King of Kings, that he also is a high priest. That's why the incense, because priests use incense, except in this parish. Myrrh, to preserve his body after his sacrifice on the cross. All those things come into play in that moment. And we realize that at least the non-Jewish scholarly world recognized in that moment who this child was. Now, it goes on from there. Simeon and Anna and others also recognize it, but it began with the Gentile world because God's relationship with humanity is now open to everyone. It isn't just God's relationship with the Jewish people. It's God's relationship with us, all of us. We are that new Israel. At Jesus' baptism, we hear a voice from heaven, presumably God himself, possibly an angel, saying, this is my son. We see the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus, just as Isaiah predicted. Speaking for God, Isaiah says, I will send my spirit upon you. And then we see it happen. And at the baptism, sorry, at the wedding feast at Cana, we realize that this wedding feast of life, this party of life to which we have all been invited may well have run dry. I know it's happened that way in my life. I know there are times when I have really felt like I have nothing left to say, I should just go away. And then I realized that in these stories, I find terrific comfort because there's nothing worse than a wedding feast running out of wine. And yet Jesus can solve that problem. What's the worst problem going on in your life right now? Depression, isolation, loneliness, fear, fear of what might happen in the coming weeks. We're only in January, flu season is just reaching its peak now. Invite Jesus Christ in. It may not solve the COVID problem immediately. I think ours staying away from each other will help that more than, more than perhaps God will in the moment, but it will help us all get through. And it may well, in fact, probably will help you feel like this little reduced feast that we are all living right now has much more hope to it than any of us thought there might be. It's a season of learning an awful lot of stuff. If you have to stop the YouTube video and go back and listen to that again, maybe even take notes, because we all have stuff to learn from this story. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. In our prayers this morning, we hold before God the Dobrant, Vanderharst, Downey, Dunn, Foley, Gaylor Martin, German, Gregory, Gabriel, Grusha, and Freeman families. We remember and give thanks for the work of the Samaritan Foundation, Dominican Advance, and the ongoing ministry and work of Not Just Tourists. We pray for those who are homeless, for their safety, their health, and salvation. In the Niagara Diocese, we remember Christ Church Wainfleet, the Reverend Nermal Mendes, Rector, the Reverend Deacon Diane Elliott, and the people of that parish. We hold before God members of the St. Thomas family who are not well or have asked for our prayers, including Sue, Leslie, Elaine, Allison, Keith, Doris, and Ed, and all those we hold before God, either out loud or in the silence of our hearts. We hold before God in prayerful support, Francis of Rome, Justin of Canterbury, Linda our Primate, Anne the Archbishop of Ontario, Susan, our bishop, and all those who work at Cathedral Place, Max, the Archdeacon of Lincoln, Kevin, our rector, Philip, John, and Jason, our honorary assistants, Aaron, Charles, and Tim, our wardens. Let us pray, saying, Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. We pray that Christ may be seen in the life of the church. You have called us into the family of those who are the children of God. May our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ be strengthened by your grace. Jesus, Lord of the church, in your mercy, hear us. You have called us to be a temple where the Holy Spirit can dwell. Give us clean hands and pure hearts so that our lives will reflect your holiness. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. You have called us to be a light to the world so that those in darkness come to you. May our lives shine as a witness to the saving grace you have given for all. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. You have called us to be members of your body so that when one suffers, all suffer together. We ask for your comfort and healing power to bring hope to those in distress. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. You have called us to be the bride where you, Lord, are the bridegroom. Prepare us for the wedding feast where we will be united with you forever. Jesus, Lord of the Church, in your mercy, hear us. Jesus, Lord of the Church, you have called us into fellowship with all your saints. We unite our prayers with theirs and ask for grace to serve you with joy where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and for all eternity. Amen. peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you take a moment and share a sign of that peace with each other? Peace Ruth, peace Joe, peace Aaron, peace. As our Savior taught us, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Again, I know that these are difficult moments in our lives for all of us, and perhaps especially for you. I'm asking that we live with faith, live with courage, and live in the firm knowledge that Jesus is present, even though this banquet seems a little troubled at the moment, and that in working together and for each other with Jesus Christ, we will get through. Our prayers are with you. If there is something, if you're a member of the community and you need help, please let us know. I have done many shopping trips in the last couple of weeks. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with us always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God.